Let's read Luke 11, 1 through 4. <clears throat> now it came to pass as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased that one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. So he said to them, when you pray, say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us day by day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Let's pray. Our Father, we are so thankful today that we have your word, and it is with a great sense of anticipation that we come once again to your word, expecting that we would meet with you today in the ministry of your word by your spirit, and you would open our hearts to understand the glorious and wonderful truths of the gospel and of Christ and of Christian principle and living that you've given to us. We pray that you would open our hearts and our minds to understand and to receive your word with faith and with obedience. We ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> so, we do take up again this morning with our study of uh, the Gospel of Luke, which has brought us to what is commonly called the Lord's Prayer. And this model prayer that Christ has given to us has been our focus now uh, for the last several weeks. Uh, here Jesus gives us an authoritative guideline and pattern uh, for our praying. And as I've, said, as I've said before many times, he's not telling us that every time we pray, we have to repeat these exact words. But what we have here is a model prayer, a guide uh, that he has given to his people uh, that provides us with a general outline of those concerns that are to characterize our prayers. And so far, we consider the first four petitions. The first three, you remember, focus on the, what we might call the purposes of God. The hallowing of God's name, the coming of his kingdom, uh, the doing of his will upon earth as it is in heaven. And then last time we opened up the fourth petition, which is the first of the three what we might call personal petitions in this prayer. And the focus shifts from the priority of God's purposes, which is the, uh, the focus of the first three petitions in this prayer. The focus shifts from that to the provision of our needs. First, we need God's material provision. The fourth petition, give us day by day our daily bread. And then even more so, we need God's pardon. The fifth petition, the one that we'll be considering today, forgive us our sins. And we need God's protection. The sixth petition, and do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Now, let me just make a few observations here. First, you'll notice in these personal petitions, there's one for the body and two for the soul. One for the body and two for the soul. One for our physical needs, give us day by day our daily bread, and two for our spiritual needs, forgive us our sins, and lead us not into temptation. Thomas Watson, uh, whom I like to quote, he's, all, he's always got all these little pithy sayings, one of the, one of the old Puritans and some of you may remember back during COVID, I was sending out these little quotes from Thomas Watson every other day or so, uh, little pithy sayings. Well, Thomas Watson makes this comment here. He says, observe hence that we are to, he's commenting on, on the two for the, one for the body, two for the soul in the Lord's Prayer. He says, observe hence that we are to be more careful for our souls than for our bodies, more careful for grace than for daily bread, and more desirous to have our souls saved than our bodies fed. And then Watson has a number of pithy comments referring to the fact that Jesus immediately follows, give us day by day our daily bread with forgive us our sins. Watson says, as man that is condemned takes little comfort from the meat you bring him in prison without a pardon, so though we have daily bread, yet it will do us no good unless sin be forgiven. Here's another one. Daily bread may satisfy the appetite, but forgiveness of sins satisfies the conscience. Here's another one of his, his little comments. He says, Alas, you may have daily bread and yet perish. 
daily bread may make us live comfortably, but forgiveness of sins makes us die comfortably. And so this morning we begin uh, to examine this fifth petition, forgive us our sins. And then uh, Jesus also draws attention to what we must be able to say honestly as well when we ask for the forgiveness of ourselves, for we also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. Now, there's a lot of important truth that's contained in what Jesus tells us here and uh, also with what he says in connection with this petition. So God willing, I hope to spend uh, probably two weeks on this part of the Lord's Prayer. And today our focus will be on the blessing sought in this petition and the persons who need to pray this petition. And then, God willing, next time we'll consider the connection Jesus draws between God's forgiveness of us and our forgiveness of others. So consider with me, first of all, today, the blessing sought in this petition. And very simply, the blessing sought is forgiveness. The forgiveness of our sins. Forgive us our sins. Now, obviously, if we're going to rightly understand this petition and let it guide our prayers, we need to have a clear and accurate and basic grasp upon what the Bible teaches about the forgiveness of sin, the forgiveness of God. Now, we hear a lot of talk about forgiveness. We were just singing about forgiveness in one of our hymns, the forgiveness of sins. We especially hear a lot said about that when we're in church. But I don't think it would be wise for me to just assume that everyone here truly knows what that means. And even those of us who do may need to have our understanding clarified and increased and more firmly grounded in our hearts. There's no blessing of the gospel more wonderful than the blessing of forgiveness. There's nothing more amazing and even shocking if we have a true sense of the evil of our sins against God Nothing more amazing, more surprising than the fact that the God of heaven, the God against whom we have sinned, the God whose wrath and eternal punishment we have deserved, that this God is a God who offers to forgive us of all of our sins. And that there is a way that you can actually know that all of your sins are forgiven. Maybe you're here today and you didn't realize that was even possible. That there is a way that you can know that all of your sins are have been forgiven by God. So it's important for us to understand what forgiveness means and how it is that God can forgive sin and how this forgiveness may become ours. So let's think about this matter of forgiveness, the blessing that's sought in this petition. Several points about it. First of all, the meaning of forgiveness. What is forgiveness? What does it mean for God to forgive sin. Well, it's described in various ways in Scripture, sometimes in picturesque language, uh, uh, describing what it means for God to forgive sin. For example, it's described in this way in Micah 7, 18 and 19. Who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity and passing over transgression? You will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. That's forgiveness. Passing over transgression, casting all of our sins into the depths of the sea. Forgiveness is described in this way in Psalm 85 two, You have forgiven the iniquity of your people. You have covered all their sin. It's described as the covering of our sins. Covering them so that they are no longer seen. Casting away our sins. Covering our sins. And Isaiah 43, 25 is described in this way. God says, I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. Forgiveness is described as blot, the blotting out of our sins and remembering them no more against us. It's been illustrated in this way. There's the ledger upon which all of my sins are recorded, all of my debts against God, and all of those sins, and if all of those sins are forgiven, they are blotted out of the ledger, never to appear on the debit side of a man's account again. They are blotted out. 
So these are some of the ways forgiveness is described. Another way to describe it is that forgiveness is a promise. In each of these passages, God is making a promise. When God forgives, what does he do? He makes a promise. He promises that all of our sins, all of our iniquities, he will remember no more against us. He tells us that they are blotted out of the record book, and he promises that he will never hold them against us now or remember them against us on the day of judgment. So this is the wonderful blessing of forgiveness spoken of here. But as we continue to focus our lens even closer on biblical forgiveness, consider secondly the source of forgiveness, the source of forgiveness. The psalmist describes the source of forgiveness in this way in Psalm 133 to 4. He says, if you, Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you that you may be feared or that you may be worshipped with reverence and awe. Godly fear. Notice the language. There is forgiveness with you. This forgiveness is with God. Now, that's a very beautiful expression. That, that language there is expressing to us something about God's character. Forgiveness is with him. That is, he is a God of forgiveness. He is a God who is ready to forgive. That's his nature. That's his character. The source of forgiveness is found in the very heart and the very character of God himself. Some of you may remember when Moses prayed that God would show him his glory. And God said, okay, Moses, I'm going to hide you in the cleft of the rock and I will pass by and I will declare my glory. I will declare my name to you. You remember that? And we read in Exodus 34, 6 and 7, and the Lord passed before him and proclaimed the, the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. Moses, would you see my glory? Would you know my name, who I am, my character, my nature? This is who I am. I am a God who is merciful, gracious, long-suffering, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. A God who is ready to forgive. Psalm 86, 5. For you, Lord, are good and ready to forgive. Nehemiah 9, 17. You are God, ready to pardon, slow to anger, abundant in kindness. In Micah 7, 18, we're told that God delights in mercy. This is God's heart. Forgiveness is with him. And it is from the heart of God that, can, that forgiveness comes. The source of forgiveness is found in the very heart and character of God. Consider thirdly, the moving cause of this forgiveness. The cause, the moving cause of this forgiveness. What is the cause of this forgiveness? Well, the moving cause of the forgiveness of sinners is nothing else but the free, unmerited grace of God. That's what grace means. Grace is God's unmerited, undeserved favor given to those who deserve the opposite. That's what grace is. And grace is the moving cause of this forgiveness. It's nothing in the one who is praying for forgiveness. It's nothing in the one who's repenting. Our forgiveness is not based upon our repentance. In fact, our repentance is never perfect, is it? And even it, it can grow and deepen over time. And uh, God doesn't, uh, doesn't forgive us because our, our confessing our sin or asking for forgiveness somehow merits his forgiveness. No. It's nothing in the one who is crying for forgiveness that merits or earns the forgiveness of his sins against God. Now, if God hears the cry of the sinner, if he is pleased to cast away his sins, to cover his sins, to blot out his sins, to remember them no more against him, this forgiveness is an act of pure grace. It's not earned. It's not deserved. God's forgiveness is not coerced by anything that the sinner himself does or is. God acts freely in the granting of his forgiveness. It is an act of free, unmerited, undeserved favor. 
Romans 3.24, being justified freely by His grace. Ephesians 2.5, by grace you have been saved. There are many texts we could look at, but notice how we see this in the prayer of the psalmist in Psalm 25.11. I want to turn over there a moment. Psalm 25.11. Jonathan Edwards has a very wonderful sermon on this text. And here's the title of it as they tended to give kind of long titles to sermons back then. Here's the title of the sermon. Great guilt, no obstacle to the pardon of of the returning sinner. Great guilt, no obstacle to the pardon of the returning sinner. Now notice David's plea in verse 11 of Psalm 25. For your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my iniquity, for it is great. And David says, Lord, I do not plead for you to pardon my sin, And with an expectation of pardon for the sake of anything worthy in me or because of anything that I've done to deserve it. Indeed, I don't plead with you to pardon because after all, all of my sins are really kind of small. They're not that big a deal after all. No, on the contrary, Lord, my sin is great. But I plead with you, O God, to pardon my iniquity for your name's sake. That name that he made pass by and declared to Moses when he hit him in the cleft of the rock. Pardon my iniquity for your name's sake. In other words, for the glory of your name, for the glory of your grace. In order that the glory of your mercy and your kindness and your grace toward sinners might be wonderfully displayed. And even more wonderfully displayed, Lord, not because my sins are small, but because my sins are great. Therefore, for your own sake, O Lord, pardon my iniquity. David understood the gracious character of God and the gracious character of the forgiveness for which he was seeking. Forgiveness finds its source in the heart of God. Its moving cause is the unmerited, undeserved grace of God and the grace of God alone. But consider now, fourthly, the basis of of God's forgiveness, the basis of God's forgiveness. But how could God just forgive sin like that? Does God sit as the ruler of heaven and earth upon his throne in heaven and look down upon sinful men and by a mere decree of his will forgive sinners? Is that what he does? And how can he just forgive sin when our sins are evil? They're wicked. They deserve punishment. In fact, they deserve, according to Scripture, the punishment of eternal damnation in hell. Is God like the crooked judge who just lets criminals get off and he doesn't enforce the law? Is there no justice with God? How can God forgive your sin, my friend? Is, it, is that just his job? That's just what God does? Uh, listen, listen, this is the, the, this is the, the dilemma... That forms the backdrop of the gospel message. This is the great question. How can a just and holy God forgive and justify sinners? How can God be holy? How can he be just, as scripture says he is, and do anything less than condemn me? We read in Proverbs seventeen fifteen, God's word says this. He who justifies the wicked... And he who condemns the just, both are an abomination to the Lord. But here we see God justifying the wicked. Here we see God forgiving and freeing from punishment the sinner who deserves to be damned. How could God do that and remain the holy and righteous God that he is? Think about David. You remember when David committed the awful, awful sins that he committed? When he... he committed adultery, slept with another man's wife. And then he lied about it and tried to cover it up, even to the point of orchestrating the murder of her husband, Uriah. And then you remember when the prophet came, Nathan, and he confronted David with his sin. And David said, I have sinned against the Lord. He confessed his sin and he repented. And the prophet said, the Lord has put away your sin. God has forgiven your sin. Well, if we have any sense of justice, 
When we read that, unless we already have a good understanding of Scripture itself, we ought to be thinking, how in the world could God do that? I mean, how do you think Uriah would feel about that? The man slept with my wife, right? He had me murdered. What about if you were Uriah's mom and dad? You know, this man stole my, my uh, son's wife. He abused his authority. He used that, that high position as a king that he had to, to abuse my son. He had my son put out in the front of the battle. Uh, uh, my son, who was a patriotic soldier fighting for the kingdom, and he had him murdered. And you're just saying, you're just going to forgive his sin? That's it? How can God do that? You remember we read when the Lord passed by Moses as he was hidden in the cleft of the rock. And you remember we read there, and the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful, gracious, long-suffering, and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. Now that's as far as I read when I quoted that earlier, but it doesn't stop there. In the very next words, God says, and by no means clearing the guilty. So wait a minute, is that not a contradiction? Have you ever read that passage before and thought, how does that, that kind of a contradiction. There's all this, he's abounding in goodness, truth, keeping mercy, forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin, and will by no means clear the guilty. Wait a minute, how does that work? God is merciful and forgiving, but He's also just and holy, and He is determined that He will not clear the guilty. He will punish sin and the sinner. Now, how do those two things go together? How is it that God is holy and just and will by no means clear the guilty, while at the same time He forgives iniquity and sin? Have you ever thought about that question? Have you ever wondered about that? I think if you've ever really understood the gospel, you've, you've faced that question, you've wrestled with that question. And this leads us to the question of the basis of this forgiveness. There is a basis upon which God forgives sinners, having determined by His free grace, out of His gracious, merciful heart, to forgive certain sinners. The righteous God has laid a righteous foundation upon which that forgiveness can be freely given and done so without compromising his justice and without defiling his holy character. And what is that foundation? What is that basis? Well, the Bible makes it clear that the forgiveness of sins is based upon the suffering and the atoning death of Jesus Christ on the cross. God the Son become man, suffering and dying in the sinner's place, Upon the cross, where the wrath and the punishment that we deserve was poured out upon him. The punishment that God's justice demands for our sins was provided for and satisfied by God himself. When God in the person of his son became man and suffered and died on the cross in our place. This is the answer to the question, the great dilemma. How can a holy God freely forgive sinners who don't deserve it and who deserve to be damned? And the answer to this was revealed to Old Testament saints in types and shadows and promises in the promises of a coming deliverer who would redeem his people from their sins. The blood of bulls and goats and lambs sacrificed upon the altar, pointing to a more perfect sacrifice that was yet to come, pointing to the Lamb of God who would take away the sin of the world. Yes, God is a God who delights in mercy. He is a God who is ready to pardon. But it's never in a way that compromises his holiness and justice. His gracious purpose toward sinners is righteously accomplished on the basis of Christ's death in the sinner's place. Not what I feel or do can give me peace with God. 
Not all my prayers and sighs and tears can bear my awful load. Thy work alone, O Christ, can ease this weight of sin. Thy blood alone, O Lamb of God, can give me peace within. We read in Ephesians 1, 7, In whom, that is in Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. Notice there, there's the forgiveness of sins. The source and moving cause of it, according to the riches of his grace. The basis of it, through the blood of Jesus Christ. It's on the basis of what Christ has done by his curse-bearing death on the cross that God is able to forgive sinners in a manner that is just and righteous, to forgive lost sinners, to forgive backslidden, fallen saints, to freely and to forgive all sins of any sinner who trusts in Jesus Christ, regardless of how many and how great and how black his sins may be. And that points us now, fifthly, to the manner in which this forgiveness is obtained. How does that forgiveness become ours? You say, well, Jesus teaches us here to pray for it. Forgive us our sins. Yes, that's true. Jesus teaches us to, to ask for this forgiveness. But as I pointed out with all these petitions, Jesus is not speaking here of a mere mechanical, heartless repetition of words. This prayer is to be offered up from the heart. That is, with understanding. Understanding the, the unmerited and free nature of this forgiveness. It's not something that's given to me because I have to do something to earn it. And, and understanding what this forgiveness is based on. And is to be obtained and received in the manner God requires in the gospel. And the scriptures are clear that this forgiveness is obtained by repentance and faith in Jesus Christ and what he has done for sinners on the cross. Not by works that we do, but by faith alone. Not by keeping the sacraments, not by going to confession, not by doing penance to try to make up for the things that we've done. You know, if you've done this sin, well, if you'll say 10 Hail Marys, then that'll make up for that. Something that we do to somehow deserve that forgiveness. It's not based on anything like that. That, that forgiveness is received by faith. Faith, like an empty hand, humbly receiving the free gift of Jesus Christ as my Savior and my Lord. And the salvation that he accomplished by his death on the cross as he is freely offered to me in the gospel and repenting of our sins against him, being grieved over what we've done against such a good and gracious God and looking to him for grace to pursue new obedience, to follow him all of our days. Repentance without faith in the gospel is useless remorse. It's useless remorse. Just feeling bad that you've done wrong is not... Uh, it, that will, you, it's useless remorse that will either lead to despair, like Judas, who felt bad about what he had done to Jesus and went out and hung himself. Or it will just lead to hardness of heart. There's nothing I can do. Why don't I just go ahead and give myself to a life of sin? There's no hope for me. No, repentance... That's not real repentance, first of all, but any kind that someone might call repentance without faith in the gospel is just useless remorse. On the other hand, faith without repentance is like grasping for pardon while still defying the God who offers it, not bowing to him. With a heart that from now, this time forward, Desires to serve him and to belong to him. Forgiveness, you see, belongs to those who repent and believe in Jesus Christ. As Jesus said, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent 
and believe the gospel. Repent of your sin, believing the good news that in Jesus Christ there is mercy and forgiveness with God. Acts 10, 43, to Christ give all the prophets witness that through his name, whoever believes in him will receive the forgiveness of sins. So, when we put all of this together, what are we praying in this fifth petition? If we are truly praying this biblically and from the heart, well, that can be summarized in this way. We are praying that God, out of his free grace, will blot out the record of our sins and transgressions against him as we put our trust in Christ and his atoning work alone and seek by God's grace to turn from those sins in the pursuit of new obedience. We are praying that God, out of his free grace, will blot out the record of our sins and transgressions against him as we put our trust in Christ and his atoning work alone and seek by God's grace to turn from those sins in the pursuit of new obedience. Now, before we go any further, I want to direct a question <clears throat> to everyone who's, who is seated here this morning. Have you, my friend, ever really prayed this fifth petition? Someone says, well, you, oh yeah, pastor, sure. Uh, you know, I used to play Little League Baseball, and we always in the dugout, you know, we would say the Lord's Prayer, including this petition, forgive us our sins. Or, or I, you know, uh, some of you may have watched some college football yesterday, and, and you remember, yeah, I remember when, when I've gone to, to games, sports games, or to football games, and yeah, many times, or maybe I played football, and we in the locker room, we'd all come together before we go out, and we'd say the Lord's Prayer, including this part of the Lord's Prayer, forgive us our trespasses or our sins and or maybe you you used to go to a liturgical church and every sunday we part of the worship service we would repeat the lord's prayer but you, that's not what i'm asking you okay that's not what i'm asking you what i'm asking is have you ever truly from the heart entered into the real spirit and meaning of this petition in other words have you ever been brought to the place that you've recognized and owned before God your guiltiness. That you have failed to render to God the obedience of heart and life that is due to Him. Have you ever acknowledged before the Holy God, truly believing it about yourself? Meaning it. Lord, I have sinned against you. Lord, I have rebelled against your laws. I am guilty in your presence. I am deserving of of your anger and your wrath. And I recognize that there is nothing that I can ever do to pay that debt. O oh Lord, hating and renouncing my sin, I cast myself in faith upon your free mercy in Jesus Christ, looking only to your Son, the Lord Jesus, and what he has done on the cross as the basis upon which I plead for pardon. O oh Lord, forgive me of my sins. Now, now I'm not asking you if, if you've ever prayed those exact words at some time in your life, but do those words find an echo in your heart, my friend, in your prayers? That's what I mean when I ask, have you ever really prayed this fifth petition? Now, you may have said these words thousands of times. Forgive us our sins or forgive me my sins. But have you ever really known what that means? Well, if you know nothing of this disposition, these sentiments that I've described and in your own heart's experience, then you've never really prayed this petition. And more than that, you're not a Christian. You're still in your sins. You're still headed for hell. You've not been forgiven. And the wrath of God is still abiding on you. But my dear friend, here's the good news. There's no reason why you can't begin to truly pray this petition. This very morning, now, this day, this morning, even this moment, you can lift up your heart to God and pray something like this. Oh God, out of your free, undeserved grace, 
And for the sake of Christ and what He has done on the cross for sinners, forgive me of all of my sins. Cover my sins, O God. Blot out my transgressions. Cast my sins into the depths of the sea of your forgetfulness, never to be remembered against me again. I'm sorry for them, Lord. I desire to be done with my sins. I'm looking in faith to your Son, Jesus Christ, as my only hope. This day, O God, hear my cry. Forgive me of my sins. My dear friend, God will hear your cry. He will hear your cry. You know, there's something very wonderful this petition tells us about the God of heaven. It tells us that God is ready and he is willing to forgive all who come to him through Jesus Christ. If you come to him trusting in Christ and what he did for sinners on the cross, God will most certainly hear your cry. And you can know, you can be assured, you can leave this place today absolutely certain that God has forgiven you and He has accepted you for Christ's sake. He will cancel out all of your debts and He will receive you to Himself as His own adopted child as if you had never sinned. My dear friends, the good news of the gospel is there is forgiveness with God. You are a God ready to pardon Nehemiah 9, 17. The Lord Jesus himself, listen, just like with these other petitions, the Lord Jesus himself tells us to pray this. Forgive us our sins. He's drawn up this petition himself. He puts it into our mouth and he says, okay, here, take this petition to my father. Go through faith in me to the God of heaven with this petition in your mouth and he will hear your cry. And he will have mercy upon you. Listen, would the Lord Jesus send you on a fool's errand? Give you this prayer. Say, take it to my Father through faith in me, repenting, looking to me, trusting in what I've done. And take this petition to my Father. Father, forgive me of my sins. Would, would Jesus send you on a fool's errand? Of course not. He gives you this petition because he knows that his Father is merciful and gracious, forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin. And that because of the cross, because of what he was about to do, because of the agony and the suffering that he was about to endure, where Christ would go to the cross and all of the wrath and punishment and judgment of a holy God would be poured out upon him in our place until he cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The answer being because he was bearing our sins upon the cross. And so he says, go to my father. Lord, forgive me of my sins. Because he knew that on that cross, he would pay for those sins and die in the sinner's place. And because of that, God can remain just and yet fully and freely and forever forgive. The sinner who repents and trusts in Jesus Christ. In fact, our Lord has told us, he's pictured for us in the parable of the prodigal son. You know that parable. Just, he pictures for us there just, just how ready and willing and even eager God is to receive the repenting sinner. You remember when the prodigal came to himself and he's wallowing in that hog pen, covered in mud, eating the food that was given to the hogs and... He's gone way down in his sin, even to the bottom. And he says when he came to himself, you remember, he got up out of the hog pen, acknowledging his folly, his sin. When he turned back toward home, what did the father do? Well, first of all, he was looking for him already, wasn't he? He was waiting for him to come. And what did he do when he saw him? Jesus says he ran to meet him. There were feet of mercy. He embraced him. He smothered him with kisses. There were arms of mercy and kisses of mercy. And he put the best robe upon him and he put a ring on his finger and he killed the fatted calf and began to be merry. And Jesus said, this is the way my father is. See, Satan would lie to you and say, that's not the way he is. He's a hard Mean God. No, Jesus says, this is the way my Father is. 
This is a picture of his heart toward all who repent and come to him for pardon through me. But of course, if you've been with us in our study of this prayer, you know that this prayer not only applies to the unconverted. It applies to Christians as well. Those who have already believed and belong to God, belong to Christ, it applies to us as well. Indeed, remember, Jesus is teaching his disciples how to pray in the Lord's Prayer. Which leads us now to consider, secondly, more briefly, the persons being taught to pray this prayer. Now, everyone who becomes a Christian has prayed this way when they were first awakened and became a Christian, at least in essence and spirit, if not in these exact words. But Jesus is teaching us here that as Christians, we are to continue to pray. Forgive us our sins. This is to be part of our regular prayer life. You remember how this model prayer begins? Our Father who is in heaven. Well, remember, only the believer is able to call God his Father. But those who are able to call God their Father, believers, are also to pray, forgive us our sins. Just as Jesus teaches us to pray, give us day by day our daily bread, he also teaches his people to pray day by day for the forgiveness of our sins. Now, some people have problems with that. You know, some of you may know there are actually those who have taught that it's wrong for Christians to pray for the forgiveness of their sins. Why? Because the Christian sins have already been forgiven. Now, perhaps you've heard that kind of teaching at some point. Now, it is true that the Christian has been justified by faith once and for all. And that means that the moment we put our trust in Christ, all of our sins are forgiven and we are counted as righteous in God's sight. That's true. Wonderfully true. Romans 5, 1, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. Romans 8, 1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The Christian in union with Christ by faith is no longer condemned. All of his sins are forgiven, past, present, and future. And he is accepted as righteous in God's sight for Christ's sake. So, It's not that uh, that once we are united to Christ as believers that when we sin, we fall back to being lost again and we have to get saved again. And we're going back and forth, being lost and being saved. No, that's not it. Our sins have been all forgiven. And we are justified, accounted righteous in God's sight. That's wonderfully true. But we're not to draw from that the wrong conclusion. A conclusion that completely contradicts The very thing that Jesus is telling Christians to do here in this prayer. We're not to conclude from this that Christians no longer need to confess their sins and ask for God's forgiveness. On the contrary, this is exactly what Jesus is telling us to do. He teaches the child of God to pray, forgive us our sins. We read in 1 John 1, 8 and 9, they're speaking to Christians. And even John the apostle concludes himself here in what he says. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And he says to the Christian there, I do not write these things that you will sin, that you may sin. No, but if any man sin, we have an advocate with the father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one who has made propitiation for our sins. But he's, he's, he's telling Christians there that we are to confess our sins to God. So how do we reconcile the fact? How do we reconcile this? That if we are in Christ, in one sense, we're already forgiven and justified completely and forever. But at the same time, the Christian is to continue to pray for the forgiveness of his or her sins. <clears throat> well, first of all, we need to understand the difference of of what, what we might call, we might describe as the difference between judicial forgiveness and parental forgiveness. Okay? Now let me quote to you from our Confession of Faith, paragraph 5, the chapter on justification. Here we have a very wise and balanced statement.
The confession says God does continue to forgive the sins of those that are justified. And although they can never fall from that state of justification, yet they may by their sins fall under God's fatherly displeasure. And in that condition, they have not usually the light of his countenance restored to them until they humble themselves, confess their sins, beg pardon, and renew their faith and repentance. You see, the believing sinner is free forever from the eternal condemnation of his sins, his or her sins. The condemning wrath of God does not rest on any justified person and never will. And we've been adopted into the family of God so that God is our father. Our position is no longer like that of the condemned criminal in the courtroom sentenced to eternal hell. We've been freed from that. We've received judicial forgiveness of all of our sins, past, present, and future. God is now our Father, and the context of our relationship to Him now, we might say, is no longer uh, the condemned criminal in the courtroom. The context of our relationship is the living room. The living room. We are His children living in His house, and that relationship will never change. God says in Psalm 89 that though he may, if necessary, visit the iniquities of his children with the rod, or spank them, in other words, or, or withdraw the sensible enjoyment of his smile, my loving kindness I will not utterly take from him, nor allow my faithfulness, my faithfulness to my promises to fail. Nevertheless, though all of that is true, still our sins against him are real sins. Against our father's love. And though he doesn't kick us out of the family, they still provoke his, as the, as the confession said, fatherly displeasure. And as such, we need forgiveness in the context of that relationship. And we need to confess our sins and repent of them in order to maintain unhindered fellowship and communion with him. We can't enjoy fellowship with God when we have a controversy with God. And that's what we're talking about. And that's the, the reality is, as believers, we always have remaining sin that clings to everything that we do. It's not that, boy, I've got to just constantly be, be raking myself over the coals trying to find every little ounce of sin that I might find. No, but we're talking about when God shows you that you've sinned. You've been convicted of sin. You've sinned in some way. You have a controversy with God in some area where you've sinned. What are you to do? Well, you're not going to be able to have communion with God and fellowship with God and enjoy the fullness of, of His smile upon you as a Christian. And indeed, you're going to grieve the Holy Spirit who lives within you, who then becomes withdrawn in his influences in your life of, in, the, in regard to peace and joy and assurance and the fruit of the Spirit, you have a controversy with God. What do you need to do? Repent. Confess your sins and ask his forgiveness. You see, this petition reminds us that though sin no longer reigns, it still remains. It's part of the believer's experience in this life. And because that is the case, repentance still remains as part of our experience. And we never get beyond the need to pray, forgive us our sins. As Martin Luther wrote in the first of the 95 theses that he posted on the door of Wittenberg Chapel. that helped to set off the Reformation. And he was speaking against penance here. He's talking about this Roman Catholic idea that here's, how, here's what we do. We, we do certain little acts of penance. And, and then once you finish that, then God... No, he says this. This is what true repentance is. He says, when our Lord and Master Jesus Christ said repent, he willed the entire life of believers be one of repentance. In other words, this is the Christian life of ongoing sanctification. In other words, putting to death sin more and more in our lives, growing in grace, becoming more like Christ as we continue believing and continue repenting of our sins as God shows us our sins until that day in glory when we will be perfectly free from sin forever. So my dear brother and sister, here's my question for you, the Christian. Let me ask you, is this the
the regular is is the regular frequent praying of this petition part of your ongoing Christian experience? Not necessarily in these words, but in principle. Are you dealing with your daily sins by daily confession and with renewed faith and trust in the cleansing blood of Christ? You know, we were talking about this in the, uh, the uh, new members class this morning. I told, I told them you're going to get a double dose of some of the things that you're going to hear uh, today. The Apostle Paul could say in Acts 24, 16, I exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense toward God and toward man. Now, what did he mean by that? Did he mean that he never sinned against God? And now he had reached p- perfect sanctification? He never was. He never failed. He never sinned against God. He never sinned against. No, that's not what he's saying. But he is saying that that he exercised himself in his Christian life to have a good conscience, to maintain a good conscience toward God and toward man. In other words, when I am aware that I have sinned against God, I just don't leave it lying there. I confess it. I return to Him and I confess my sin. And I ask for his continued forgiveness of my sin, and I have a good conscience. My conscience is constantly being washed, as it were, in the blood of Christ, as I confess. Or if I'm aware that I've sinned against someone else, in a way that they're aware of, or a way that's consciously harmed them. I don't just leave it there. I make it right with them, so that I have a conscience void of offense toward man. Paul says, I, this is the way I live my life. Exercising myself to have always a conscience void of offense toward God and toward man. Which involves praying this petition. Forgive me of my sin, O Father. Are you seeking to do that? Husbands, when you've had those sharp words with your wife, do you deal with your sin immediately? Or as soon as possible? By confession to God? Do you pray, Oh, Father, forgive me of my sin? And, and you also need to ask her forgiveness too, right? Wife, what about in your relationship to your husband? What about you young people? When you gossip about someone, or when you become aware that you've said something that's not true, you've lied, Or when you indulge yourself in lustful thoughts and the Holy Spirit convicts you in your conscience of sin, do you confess your sin to God? Asking Him for Christ's sake to forgive you. Praying for grace to mortify that sin, to forsake it. And when you mouth off or you talk back to your mom and dad or you speak disrespectfully to them, what do you do? Do you just let those sins continue? Without repentance? What do you do about it? You say, oh, well, they, they're okay with it. Mom and dad, they overlook it. They're used to it. But what about God? Your parents don't have any power to forgive sin that's against God. They can forgive your sin against them in terms of your relationship to them. But when you sin against your parents, you're not only sinning against them... You're sinning against God, and only God can forgive sin against Him, and He doesn't if you don't judge it before Him for what it is, and if you don't ask Him, for Christ's sake, to forgive you. Now, I could go on with this and press our consciences in a host of different areas. Is it not true, brothers and sisters, that there's rarely ever a day goes by When your conscience is not convicted by the Holy Spirit that you have sinned against God in some way. But I do fear, I do, I do fear this, that there may be some of you and you can go for many days and even for weeks. And though you've sinned against God many times, again, I'm not talking about just the the sin that clings to everything we do. I'm not talking about this kind of morbid introspection where you're, you're paralyzed, because, but I'm talking about sins that you've committed in, in your thoughts or your actions in some way. And God has convicted you of those sins. You know that, that you've sinned. And there may be some of you, I'm afraid, who can go for many days and even weeks. And though you've sinned against God many times, ways you know and are made aware of, you never 
are very rarely, if ever, are found confessing those sins and crying to him, O oh, Father, for Christ's sake, forgive me of my sin. How can you live that way, my friend? How can you live that way? If you can go for many days or even weeks without praying this petition from the heart, Oh God, forgive me of my sin. There's only one of two possible explanations for that. One is you're not really a Christian. You've never been made aware of your spiritual needs. You've never been given a new heart. You're still spiritually dead. And you've never been awakened to spiritual realities. And the needs of your soul are the other possible explanation. If you're going for days and days without confessing your sins before God, is that you, my friend, are in a terrible state of backsliding. And you have drifted away from the Lord and you've allowed your conscience to become defiled and to grow dull, and you need to wake up today, and you need to shake yourself out of your spiritual slumber, and confess your sin of backsliding, and draw near to God once again. I used the illustration in the class of uh, kids keeping their room clean. You know, it's nice when the, the room, those rare occasions, when the room is is very neat and clean and everything's perfect, you know. How do you keep it that way? How do you keep it that way, boys and girls? Well, when you drop when you when you go in your bedroom and you change clothes and you drop a piece of piece of clothing on the floor, what do you do? You pick it up, right? You put it where it goes. You don't just leave it lying there. That's how that's how you maintain a a, a healthy climate within the context of your room, right? Well, what, what tends to happen? Well, you go, you drop a piece of clothing, you, you don't pick it up. Then you go a little later, you drop something else, you don't pick it up. And then you leave your hamster food lying over, that fell over on the floor, and it's, you just leave it there. And next thing you know, your room is a disaster area, right? And you almost grow hardened to the whole thing. When, you're, when, when it's first really clean, you're, you're, you're sensitive, right? You want to you take care of it. Or it's like, it's like when you have a clean tablecloth, okay? Perfectly white. And you sit down to eat some, a hot dog, and you put some ketchup on the hot dog, and a little bit of uh, ketchup falls on the, the white. What do you want to do? Clean it up. Let's get it cleaned off, right? But what happens when you don't do that? Well, a little ketchup, a little mustard the next day, a little chili. And this next thing you know, it's a mess, and now you're at a point where, you know, it's impossible. Who cares anymore? Right? We're not to live that way as Christians. When we drop something on the floor, pick it up. Right? Confess it. Repent of it. Maybe you've dropped a lot of things on the floor. You know, Paul, there, there's the, the issue of attaining and maintaining a conscience void of offense. Maybe there's things you've dropped on the floor that you need to pick up. You need to pick up. You need to confess them, those things to God. There may be people you need to make things right with that you know. That that still lying in the floor in your spiritual bedroom, you need to pick it up. Right? That's the way we are to live as Christians. And as we live that way, we maintain a sensitive conscience, right? And we walk in communion and fellowship with the Lord. We, what, what John refers to as walking in the light. In other words, we're not hiding from God. We're not hiding our sins from God. We're opening our heart up to God's conviction. We can do that. We can do that as Christians because we know that our sins have been dealt with on the cross. We don't have to feel like every time God shows us that we sinned, oh no, now I'm not a Christian anymore. Now I don't have any hope. No, within the context of the freedom and the grace and the forgiveness that we have in the gospel, we can open up our hearts and say, Lord, show me everything that you're displeased with in my life. And we can confess it believing that His blood, that Christ cleanses us, and we walk in the light. The Bible says God gives grace to the humble. He stiff arms the proud. Think of the humble man as the man who's bent over when it comes to God. He, he's bent over in a humble disposition when God shows him his sin. He's quick to confess those sins and to humble himself. The proud man justifies himself or covers his sins or 
hides his sins or minimizes his sins and the humbling work of confessing his sins he doesn't he doesn't desire to do but if we're humbling ourselves and walking in the light God's pouring his grace into our lives and as we live that way he's not going to just leave us where we were he's going to be, he's going to be enabling us to grow in holiness and godliness you see and let us rejoice in this that Dear Christian, my brothers and sisters in Christ, let us rejoice that our Heavenly Father is full of mercy. There is forgiveness with Him. And that includes continuing forgiveness with Him. And though we find ourselves having to pray this petition over and over and over again, sometimes struggling with the same sin today that we struggled with yesterday, confessing the same thing over and over again, yet he never tires of hearing us cry to him, and he never ceases to forgive us as we come to him day by day, confessing those sins, trusting in his mercy that has been freely given to us in Christ. And as we do so day by day, walking humbly before him, he also promises us to, to give us grace to enable us to grow and to put those sins to death more and more and to increase in every Christ-like virtue. He doesn't just forgive us and leave us where we are. He continues to work in us by His Spirit, and He will complete that work which He has started of conforming us into the image of His Son until that day when we will be perfectly like Him in glory, and we will never struggle with remaining sin. And listen, we will never need to pray this petition ever again. Won't that be great? Amen. No longer will we need to pray, forgive us our sins, because we'll be freed perfectly from sin forever. Even so, Lord, come quickly. Come quickly. Well, let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you this morning for this, your word. We pray that uh, you would... Bless your word to our hearts, even as you have determined and purposed to do today. We pray for the lost sinner today, the one who has never known your forgiveness. Help them, Lord, to see that you are a God ready to pardon, that the way has been opened wherein you remain just and yet fully and freely forgive helpless, condemned sinners who come to you through Christ for mercy. And for us, your people, help us to walk in this way day by day, keeping short sin accounts, as it were, maintaining a conscience void of offense toward God and man, that we might walk in unbroken and unhindered fellowship and communion with you, and that we might grow in grace and holiness and Christ-likeness. And we do pray, uh, even so, Lord, that you would come, that the day would soon arrive when we'd never have to pray this prayer again. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen.